Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, this is one of the concurrent panels con currently, or just about to begin. Um, we are going to be talking about leveraging political transitions in the tribal areas of Pakistan with an all-star panel. Um, and we have just about 75 minutes, so we're going to get started um, right now. Um, so, uh, so I hope uh, many of you, if not all of you, had a chance to listen to Sumbal's very compelling uh, presentation earlier. And we have, as I said, an all-star panel um, with Mr. Abbas Khan and uh, Dr. Jamila Razak, who are here from Pakistan, who traveled specifically from Pakistan. I think you arrived yesterday and Jamila arrived a few days ago. Um, so I'll introduce them in more detail um, in, in just a few moments. But uh, today we're here to discuss um, girls' education in um, the former federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan. And I want to give you just a little bit of context about the, the region uh, before introducing, as I said, our panelists and, and what we'll be discussing um, over the next um, hour and, and 10 minutes. Uh, so the, the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan, um, as they were known until um, uh, earlier this year, until July of 2018, um, is an area on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan um, of five million people. Um, and until uh, recently, it was governed by um, a law known as the Frontier Crimes Regulation under the Constitution of Pakistan, but separately. So this is an area really known for being quite lawless, um, where the, the writ of the state uh, was not fully implemented, uh, but now it is fully integrated, or it's in a transition process of being fully integrated into the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which is the northwest, uh, which was formerly known as the Northwest Frontier Province of Pakistan. Um, we'll also call it KP. Um, and now these districts are known as the newly merged districts as of July 16, 2018. Um, and so what we will be talking about today are, um, is sort of girls' education in FATA, the barriers faced by girls in particular um, there, and the opportunities that girls have um, uh, looking ahead, all in the context of the political transition that is currently underway in that, that region. So um, let me introduce our, our panelists. You all know no, um, no Sumbal from uh, earlier in the day, but let me briefly reintroduce her. Um, so Sumbal Naveed is an education specialist um, with USAID Pakistan and currently an Echidna Global Scholar at Brookings. Um, she has her work spans 19 years at both the classroom and policy level. She has been involved in designing a number of education programs, evaluations, and research studies, including the early grade reading assessment. Um, uh, so uh, you'll see that actually on this panel, we have uh, a combined number of many decades of experience. Um, Jamila Razak on Sumbal's right. Um, is the co-founder and president of the APA Aziz Trust. Um, and she was, three years ago, um, uh, an Echidna Global Scholar uh, here uh, at the Center for Universal Education in 2015. Um, Jamila has spent the last two and a half decades contributing to the field of education by working in diverse roles, systems, and locations. And currently, she's leading a number of programs for the promotion of girls' education in Pakistan in collaboration with local networks and organizations working at the grassroots levels. Uh, Mr. Abbas Khan um, is the additional director for planning and monitoring in the Directorate of Education for the tribal districts, the ex Fata region in Pakistan. His position involves planning for the establishment of primary schools and, well, planning for the establishment of schools at the primary, secondary, and post-secondary level. And he coordinates with all donors that promote education, particularly for girls. Um, and he supports the education department of the tribal districts. Um, just, a, just a couple of words on um, Sumbal's, uh, Sumbal's paper uh, before we move forward. Uh, so in, in Sumbal's paper, she looks at the education sector plan that was developed by the Directorate of Education for the newly merged districts. And this is a comprehensive five-year plan. And she identifies the gaps in the education sector plan vis-a-vis -vis girls' education 
um, and uses that to look at um, the barriers and opportunities, as I said, uh, to girls' education. So, uh, you know, one of the one of the, the key things to think about when you think about the, the Fatah region is that it is a post-war region because it has, um, as Sumbal has mentioned, um, dealt with uh, decades of Talibanization, displacement, and violence, but has emerged uh, now uh, in as much as, you know, th there is still violence in the region, but it has really emerged much more as a post-war region. And so that is the context in which we'll be looking at things. Um, as I go forward, you know, we will uh, be hearing from all our panelists, and, and we're really going to be looking a little bit uh, at the myths and realities surrounding girls' education in FATA, the infrastructure uh, problems there, the transition as we're looking ahead, and if we have time, which I hope we do, getting down to some more details at, granularly at the classroom um, uh, level, at looking at providing transportation, looking at teachers, and so on. So without, without further ado... Um, I, I'd love to start um, with with Jamila and and Mr. Khan. Um, if you could both describe your role in promoting girls' education and your experience uh, in in Pakistan, and comment on what you think the opportunities are stemming from this political transition and merger. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is uh, Abbas Khan, and uh, I'm working as an uh, additional director in the Directorate of Education, uh, uh, erstwhile FATA, and now it is known as uh, newly merged district, as Madiha has told you. Uh, actually, my work is about the planning for the entire FATA. Uh, FATA region has got uh, seven agencies. Now they are converted into districts. And six uh, FRs, uh, frontier regions. Uh, actually, frontier regions uh, are not that much tribal areas like the seven areas. They are adjacent to, they are in between the uh, settled area and the tribal area. For example, FR Peshawar, FRDA Khan. So these are adjacent area with settled area. So we do planning for them as well. Uh, as my job is involved, I have uh, worked as deputy director in the Directorate of Education, KP, as well as I remain um, project director for the promotion of education, uh, girls' education in FATA as well and uh, which was uh, actually a uh, World Food Program, UNWFP assisted program. And uh, the aim was uh, in just to incentivize the female students uh, and uh, bring them to the school. So the results were very good at that time. And uh, in case of planning, we do uh, planning for establishment of schools. There is criteria which is approved criteria from the uh, government side that how we will establish school for the girls and for the boys as well and uh, how much population will be there and uh, what will be the distance from the nearest school. And secondly, we also keep in mind the GIS system uh, as well because in the past uh, some of the schools were uh, constructed uh, which were not feasible and uh, now we are taking help of modern uh, techniques and we use GIS. Then uh, we do not establish you know uh, middle or secondary schools but we upgrade the existing primary schools to middle and middle schools to high school and then high schools to uh, higher secondary schools. Now, we will discuss uh, later on about uh, enrollment and other issues, uh, but at the moment, uh, uh, I just want to mention that uh, the planning uh, department of uh, education uh, department, it also deals with the uh, soft component as well. <coughs> uh, 
The soft component is uh, the uh, teacher training, the CPD, the continuous professional development for the teacher. Because uh, the, on one side, if we are bringing more children to the school, on the other hand, we are supposed to give them quality education. And for quality education, the, the, the training of the teacher is essential part. So we want to keep them, you know, abreast with, uh, and, uh, with the modern techniques uh, for teaching purposes. So we do planning for the uh, teacher training as well. So these are the uh, basic uh, work which I do in the Directorate of Education, FATA. And secondly, uh, how uh, now we have merged with the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa uh, province, uh, and uh, my role is intact. Uh, there is no change uh, has been taken place in my role. I do the same thing uh, because it's instruction from the government. Uh, they, the directorate of uh, Earth while FATA will remain intact. Uh, it is because that the government is giving top priority to the FATA region. Because if we are merged with the KP, the direct rates are merged with the KP, so there will be no focus on the tribal region. The government, the provincial government, as well as the central government, they both are focusing on the education and other social sectors as well. So they want to keep the direct rates and the staff intact so that they may be able to work and focus on the most neglected areas of the Fatan. So the, my role is still intact. Thank you. So just, just very quickly to, to give um, you a little bit of context politically, um, Pakistan in July 2018 held general elections and um, the current government is led by um, the Pakistan Tehreek and Saaf party, uh, the PTI, um, the Prime Minister is Imran Khan, and this party was in power. This is its first time um, at, in power at the federal level, but this party was in power at the provincial level in the previous term as well. So it has experience uh, in KP, so, so that's the, the in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa district uh, uh, region. And um, so it is particularly important and relevant now that the merger is taking place. And this is sort of a key um, sort of component uh, of uh, Imran Khan's vision of the region. Um, so we'll, we'll go uh, to Jamila. Jamila, if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of if you see any potential pitfalls in this mo moment, but also the opportunities that you see um, in this moment, given your experience. Thank you very much. Uh, the um, uh, context has been laid out very elaborately by Madiha and then Abbasab. But I would just add that uh, into this context, we need to take historical, a longer shot of the history as well, because Fata at one time was the land of music and hospitality, and then War of Titans happened. And so these people uh, in Fata, when we go there and when we uh, uh, start working, in the region, we have to start with this historical perspective as well, that these people are afflicted and affected by war for a long time. And they have, as Sumbal also said in her uh, presentation, that people, girls living there are as intelligent, as warm-hearted, and as loving as rest of the country and rest of the world are. So that is that would be my starting point, and then uh, the opportunities, some of these you have alluded to, but two main things which, will, uh, which, which I see as opportunities are, one is the governance system, uh, which will be now an improved version of what existed before this merger. Now, uh, FATA will be part of larger provincial government, which has uh, more structured government in place. And uh, because uh, before this merger, FATA was reliant on, often on support from federal government for uh, funding for education, for allocation of posts. There were no teachers in the schools. And when FATA applied for uh, more posts, 
Sometimes their cases were held in the in the many offices at the federal level for many months. So they will get a better, quicker response to their needs. That is the improved governance is one opportunity. Second is better monitoring system because FATA, as it was under resourced, both financially and in human resource. Uh, perspective. So uh, when uh, they'll be part of the provincial government, uh, uh, KP government, along with other uh, provincial governments, now have extensive monitoring systems which are using uh, tabs and uh, real-time data collection from schools, whether the teachers are in the schools, and uh, they're going beyond just uh, uh, attendance of school and uh, uh, teachers and students, but also looking at the learning outcomes to an extent, that what are children learning in uh, schools. So when uh, FATA will be part of the provincial government, larger system, they will benefit from this uh, monitoring system of the schools, which will monitor the facilities, teachers, the need of need for teachers, and the learning process happening. In, uh, in the schools. That is the opportunities part, two main, main uh, points which I could see. And then uh, you said that uh, as soon as like, there is enough now background to give you an idea that what the situation of education more generally and of girls' education is in FATA. Like there are more than 78% girls who are out of school who should be in school in compulsory school age. So, and gender parity is one of the lowest in uh, FATA region. So these are, uh, these establish that we have a uh, very clear need to work more on education and girls' education in FATA. But then who will do it and how it will be done? These are the two questions which now need to be figured out. Uh, fig uh, one then is the actors, like who will take uh, action and who will work in FATA. First is the government, the government of Pakistan, now government of FATA, whether directorate remains as a directorate of FATA or uh, there is any other structure. That is, uh, that is the basic constitutional responsibility of government of Pakistan. Uh, one major actor would be government. Second will be donors, uh, donor community. Then I know that a number of donors are now designing their programs for FATA region. And here with actors are the pitfalls. Because uh, you need to, I sometimes uh, use this term that it is a bit provocative, so excuse me for <laughs> being. So uh, you need to get down high high horse of being saviors, the saviorism. We'll have to be work with people as partners and work with local people, find local partners, local solutions, and don't jump into the field with the ideas which are conceived and developed somewhere else. And that has been said a number of times. <laughs> And then there'll be uh, international NGOs, local uh, NGOs, who will be then uh, uh, gearing themselves for the funding, which will be available through different donors. So there, I'll go back to the paper which I wrote for uh, as a Kidna scholar three years ago. And I laid out I, one of, uh, I studied three models uh, of uh, like how we can improve girls' education services in Pakistan. And irrespective of where those models were, I came up with three, four, four steps uh, process. And one was uh, the, this, uh, the three, uh, four uh, steps of this process are still valid. And I can quote those that one was that go with, first thing is go with respect for the local culture and we, we sometimes, uh, because people are different from us, it does not mean that we can devalue. And we, uh, ha like, that is the entry point, that you go with genuine respect for the local culture and local people and their traditions. And the second was to make 
alliances, like there are gatekeepers. It, ha it has been referred to uh, Medallo and uh, uh, Mayada in the morning session that there are religious leaders, there are political leaders, there are community leaders, they are the gatekeepers. Make alliance with them, but then you need a wider network of people, which, which will be those uh, people who, who, who have to, who we have to win over as our allies. That is a wider network of community leaders. And when we get into the field, then we have to deliver. There is where the real test comes, that it is uh, whatever commitments are made by the government, by the donor, by the international or the national NGOs, they have to take the responsibility and they have to be accountable for all those targets, for all those, uh, the scope of work or the uh, budget they uh, get. And th those are four, three steps. And the fourth is that make the services relevant for the local needs and lo local people. And I, my paper, uh, I spoke at length about that. You can refer to it, I'll not go into details, but that was that what people see as relevant for them. What is more like, where they see the value, the quality, what is quality? Whether it is quality from a standard, uh, an academic standard developed in a university or the quality, how, parents and communities see it as a quality. So these are the important uh, considerations and these can be pitfalls as well. So that is how I see the issue, thank you. Thank you both for very comprehensively um, setting um, sort of the, the, the stage, as it were, um, uh, and, and, and really sort of driving forward the discussion. Um, Sumbal, I, I'd, I'd love for you uh, to, to talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, your field work, essentially, your, how, how you got access to the communities that you, you talked to and what surprised you. But I would, um, before that, you know, I just wanted to, again, cite a couple of statistics that you cited in your presentation. Um, the fact that 37% of girls are enrolled in primary schools in um, the newly merged districts, but only 5% of girls are enrolled in secondary schools. These very striking statistics. 49% of boys are enrolled in primary schools, but again, only 16% of boys are enrolled in secondary schools. So if you can, and, and you know, we know that w one of the things that differentiates FATA from the rest of Pakistan is um, the history of violence and Talibanization there. But if you can tell us a little bit about some um, of the sort of the, the barriers uh, and that that you identified um, distance, um, the attitudes of parents, um, access to teachers, um, work opportunities for girls, how these differ in FATA relative to the rest of Pakistan because um, you know as, as all of us know, a lot of the same barriers to girls' education exist in the rest of Pakistan. what what makes FATA different? Yeah, thank you very much for this comprehensive question. Before I dive deep into the second part of your question, I would like to focus on the first part, and that is that uh, the entry for me to collect data in this region was made possible because of people like Abbasab. <laughs> because um, in this highly restricted uh, security risk area, you cannot enter, full stop. You need some support from the local communities from people like Abbasab in the government to get into that at the first place. And then you asked me what, what surprised me. These were girls, girls in that region. So they were, they were really excited. When they started talking to me, they had a long list to tell me to give as a message to the government, including, including from the water they needed in school, washroom, boundary walls, transportation. And then the best message that I got from one of the girls from grade six was, can you please make it possible to have science education in our school? I want to be a doctor. I'm in grade six. Is it possible for you to do it like in the next two, three years so that by the time I get there, I have the opportunity to study science? So that surprised me. 
because like many of you, I wasn't able to go to FATA. I was just listening to some stories because there is no data available on this region that I could read to and really get an idea of what is happening. The only stories I could read were from uh, the Talibanization time. You know, this has happened, bombing, killing, and that's it. So what exactly is happening in the education sector was not clearly known. So that's why I think this study that I've just done is going to help us all as, as partners to see, you know, where, where we need to start with. Because this is a war zone that has, you know, everything is demolished. So it's, it's taking a new start now with the peace establishment as the first step. So girls in that area really need a lot of support, and so do others who are trying to make education possible for these girls. So that's surprising. The other thing surprising for me was teachers. Teachers. And when I talked to them, the first thing that excited them was that somebody for the first time has come down to talk to them. So that was the most exciting thing for them. And they then again, like girls, had a huge list of their own problems rather than talking about the girls' problems themselves. So it, it's a complex issue. It does not stop just on girls. It is a complex issue interconnected uh, with several other things happening in that region. So now I'll get to your second part. And that is what, it, what makes us different. So, you know, generally, you see many other girls even in not going to school in the rest of Pakistan. But if you just increase those problems 100 times, that's what FATA is. So in the rest of Pakistan, people have the opportunity, girls specifically, parents, to see that other girls are getting education. They have different roles to play. But those in FATA were in limbo. They were isolated. They haven't seen girls into different roles that they can play other than just, you know, getting married and taking care of children, which are sometimes more than a dozen. So that's, that's the main difference, because the community in this region did not have an exposure. One interesting finding that you will see in my paper as well, and I'm going to really focus on it when I move forward with my, with my future writings, is that exposure for this community was a turning point especially when they moved from FATA to the neighboring province as temporarily displaced people. So that gave them an exposure to the neighboring province to see that people who speak the same language, who wear the same clothes, who have the same lifestyle, are having a different life. Where the girls can, can drive a car, where the girls can be doctors, they are in offices. So many people in FATA really found it maybe, maybe not, not like something comfortable, but there would be many others who thought it was, a, it was something to change. It was something to ponder on. And that, I think, is the beginning of change in this region. So people like Abasa, because he also belongs to Fata, are also you know, a source of encouragement. His daughters, who have, who have done graduation, right? So his daughters are a source of, you know, understanding and exposure to many other people in FATA, especially those who live in the farther areas towards the Afghanistan border, because they are the ones who had no exposure to a normal life, as compared to those living near the edge of FATA, which, which is near KP, and they have easy access to KP. KP. So th that makes this region different, and that makes education problems different uh, for girls as compared to the rest of Pakistan. Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, please. I mean, just one thing that I would, would interject and, and say is um, thanks for giving that sort of on-the-ground perspective um, of, of girls in FATA. I, I can say that I, I actually realize that I've neglected to introduce myself. So my name is Medea Avzal. I'm a non-resident fellow here at Brookings, and much of my work actually looks at education and extremism in Pakistan. And I wasn't able to travel to FATA for my own research, but the university students whom I interviewed in Lahore, many of them were boarding um, uh, sort of borders from FATA, um, all men though. Um, so it was a very refreshing perspective that I heard on extremism, et cetera, from them. Um, but I did not have the chance to meet any, uh, any um, young women who were university students from, from, yeah, from FATA. Um, but uh, yes, please, Mr. Abbas. 
Over to you. Yeah, th and thank you, Madhya. Uh, I'm just adding a few things to um, Sumbal uh, uh, talkings. Uh, Actually, you know, the teacher, uh, the, the, the people of the FATA, they are very simple people. They, they don't want to send their children to the school. And they, their mindset is like uh, this. Uh, for example, when we do enrollment drive, each year we do enrollment drive in uh, um, FATA. That is in uh, March, April, and then in October. So... We cannot, you know, openly ask the parents to send their daughters, their sisters to the school. This is the situation. We ask them to send their children to the school. It means if we directly say to anyone to bring your daughter to the school, so this is, a, you know, a bad thing for them. They, they, they don't like words like, like this. So we openly ask them to send their children to the school zone. And uh, up to exposure, yes, they are not exposed to the society. They are very simple people. They are uh, just restricted to their home. Uh, I just want to mention one incident. Once uh, a man from the FATA, uh, his wife was ill, and he was supposed to take her to the doctor. So... First, he was reluctant that there was no female doctor. Then uh, he, wo he became uh, aggrieved and took her to the doctor. And the doctor was investigating her and asked the lady, okay, show me your mouth, open your mouth. The man said, no, she will not show you uh, her mouth because uh, she is my wife and she will show the mouth only to me and not to you. So this is the case with the people uh, over there. And uh, secondly, uh, I just adding to teacher absenteeism, which uh, uh, Dr. Jamila has talked about. So there is teacher absenteeism, and this is one of the major issues for all of us uh, who are working in the directorate, because we hire teachers, we recruit teachers, but Local teachers are unavailable. Sumbal has uh, mentioned this issue in her paper. And we hire teachers from adjacent area or from the settled area. So due to the uncertain condition and security reason, those teachers who are not from the local villages, they do not come to the school. So automatically when they are not coming to the school, the children come to the school, they wait for their female teacher so if she is not coming to a school, automatically they, they leave the school. So this also increases the rate of the dropout as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so actually, Mr. Abbas, if you could um, expand uh, a little bit on, on what you um, discussed earlier um, and talk about whether you think it's naive to think that an approach that worked in KP can, can work in the newly merged districts uh, for, the, for the PTI government. And if you can talk about some of the infrastructural, um, bureaucratic, economic obstacles that um, you see uh, ahead. You know, you talked about teacher absenteeism being a problem, but if you could talk a little bit more about the infrastructural problems you see in the transition ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, when we are uh, uh, merged with the uh, KP, you know, the KP government ha has been focusing, the PTI government is there, and they have been uh, focusing on education. They ha have allocated uh, more than 28% of their budget to education. And now we see that they, the, the, the KP province is on the top of education among all the provinces in, uh, in Pakistan. So once we are merged with uh, KP, so all those facilities, all those things will also be automatically come to uh, FATA. And now it is, we have been uh, holding meeting, you know, with the high ups, uh, the officials of the KP government, uh, and they have been focusing on education, both for girls and for the uh, boys, uh, to bring it par with the 
uh, KP. And uh, probably there will be no issue, you know, uh, while we are merging with the, with, with the KP because they are already ready for the same. They have worked on the, for the uh, plan for the uh, merger of the FATA district with the uh, KP. And uh, there are certain, you know, uh, things um, which um, are already introduced uh, in the KP and which has profound effect on the schooling. For example, IMU system. Um, uh, IMU system is an independent monitoring system which is uh, already there with the help of the uh, DFID. And it, its results are marvelous. The teacher attendance there is, you know, that is ensured. The quality of education has already been improved there. And secondly, the, the, the infrastructure. Now we have only two, two room schools. And automatically, you know, the infrastructure will also improve. And thirdly, I, I, I'm, uh, I won't take too long because there are certain issues, but I'm not taking too long. Uh, for example, the, uh, the basic facilities in a school, they are also meager in FATA. You know, last year, a, a survey was conducted in Kaber Agency, and it was found that 50% of the area uh, female uh, in the female school well, fifty percent of the girls they left the school because of the insufficient, you know, the washrooms in the school. If if this is the condition of the school, obviously the uh, the female students will be reluctant and they will be unwilling to come to the schools. So obviously the 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 KP government is focusing and they are watching these things uh, and they 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 have been trying to allocate funds for this and they have made. Uh, in collaboration, the FATA 10 years socioeconomic plan and five years socioeconomic uh, plan. They are mega projects. Uh, actually, they want to bring FATA at par with the KP. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we will, in about 10 minutes, come to, to all of you with um, and ask uh, you to ask questions. Um, and so we'll open this up. Uh, but, but in the meantime, I wonder if, um, Jamila, if you could tell us a little bit about um, community schools. And if you think community schools are a lever we should pay particular attention to, because Sumbal very nicely pointed out um, the numbers of community schools uh, in her paper, and that they far outnumber, actually, the number of government-provided schools. Thanks. Yeah, that was part of uh, my paper as well, that I also looked at the community schools as a possibility f to promote girls' education in different parts of the country. So uh, community schools are a big opportunity, and there are reasons for it, because they have been established very close to the homes of girls. That's why parents send even girls and willingly send their girls to these schools. Secondly, that these schools are uh, the teachers there are also from the local community, so that, that element of trust, that who is the teacher their girls are going to uh, be with. So these uh, positives of community schools are there, but at the same time, they cannot be left to be governed by, uh, by uh, those organizations who are working on project modes, because bo most of these community schools have been established through donor funding, and these have been established under some project uh, for any program. So the long -term sustain, for the long-term sustainability of these community schools, now government will have to establish or develop some infrastructure. It exists for other provinces. There are education foundations where there are possibilities and there are different models of public-private partnerships and there are community schools and low-fee uh, private schools which have been established in rest of the country under these infrastructures. So uh, I hope that with merger of uh, FATA with KP, those education foundation infrastructure will also be used to regulate, monitor, monitor the quality, and then provide support for these schools. Because... These schools are the only option at the moment. Till the time government constructs 
numerous schools because in my study, when I went there in FATA three years ago, these community schools, the basic criteria of the establishment of these community schools was that there was no other school, primary school in the radius of three to five kilometers in mountainous, mountainous areas, in war-affected areas, in insecure uh, area, that is a long distance. So there are no public schools. There is no uh, provision of schools, government schools or private schools in the area. So this is the only option for girls. So community schools are, uh, are making great contribution. They are accepted in the communities because they have been established on that process, which I studied and I drew that process from those examples of establishing community schools in FATA and other parts of the country. So uh, I, I would say that these, these are there and they are the only option and there should be more support from government for these community schools and there should be regulation for their quality control and monitored and supported so that they can perform and provide the services to uh, to those girls, which 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 have those who have no access to any other service, neither private or public. That's actually really useful. So the uh, the education foundations that you refer to in Punjab and in Sindh have been quite successful. Uh, the Punjab Education Foundation, the Sindh Education Foundation, you know, their programs have been evaluated and found to increase girls' enrollment in particular. Um, so, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, so while before we before we wrap up in terms of um, the the panel and come to you, um, Sumbal, I wonder if you could. Uh, Take your uh, policy recommendation sort of that, that you uh, came up with at the end of your presentation and that are of course in your paper and, and talk about sort of what comes next in terms of this transition, right? And, and talk a little bit about any particular challenges or problems that you want to identify, um, talking about teachers uh, if you would like to or uh, at the classroom uh, level at the, you know, at sort of the granular level that you see going forward. It's, it's really hard because there is so much to do in this region uh, that I'm still struggling with where to start with. Um, because definitely uh, the first thing that these girls need are schools, but I cannot provide them schools. So then is the next step. So what else can I do? So the most important thing that I'm thinking is maybe looking at the overall, I won't say curriculum, I would say syllabus to see what are the gender gaps. So my, you have heard Maida talking about uh, gender mapping of, of the slavers. So maybe that's one thing that we can do to really focus on one of my important findings and the very interesting findings was that there is lack of general understanding on the broader purpose of education for girls and roles that they can play within a society because people haven't seen those roles, uh, girls being played in that region. So I think doing that and then incorporating something in, in the teaching learning material is, is going to help that region to look beyond just having uh, girls as, as good mothers. So I think that's one thing that we can do. The other thing which I, I think can be helpful is in terms of having some sort of awareness within the community that yes, these roles are possible and then how they can help their girls to really, to really you know, get to the education and schools. So these are the important things that we can work on along with maybe having 21st century skills included in, in, in their education because quality education is another issue. So if the girls are not going to, if those girls who are going to school are dropping out, the most important reason that my research identifies is the quality of education because they don't get anything when they even are able to access schools. Very quickly, before we, we come to you, Jamila, if you could talk a little bit um, about um, anything that you would like to add from your experience working on the AGES project, um, which, for those of you who don't know, is a USAID-funded program focusing on girls' education and skills development um, in that region. Um, so anything that you see about the merger creating opportunities or challenges for, for programs going forward there? And you, you talked about that a little bit, uh, obviously, at, at, the, at the very beginning. 
Yeah, but uh, when I was uh, mentioning these different stakeholders and actors, then one thing which I would add to that part uh, is the, uh, I would use the term diaspora because there are a number of families who have left Fata a long time ago. They are settled in different parts of Pakistan. Their girls, their women are playing the, the, the roles in society which other Pakistani women are. So they are a very effective group that they can be involved in uh, promoting girls' education back in Fata. That is something which is an opportunity because I, I myself in my personal circle, I know many people who, have, uh, who are serving in different parts, in different departments, in different uh, cities of Pakistan. And their uh, daughters are going to uh, universities, schools, and they are the people uh, whom people from FATA will easily relate to because they, have, they are related to those families. And if that is a very powerful group, that if they can be used as, uh, as the messengers and, as the, and their women and their daughters and their girls in the, those families can be used as role models. Because as uh, Sumbal has said, that there are, uh, th there are families who could not leave. They are the ones who are most marginalized, whoever had means to move out has moved out and they are settled in other cities and in other, other urban centers. So, but they have families, they go back to those areas. If they can be, uh, they can be activated and they can be used, they can be very effective group of uh, people who can bring that social change and social advocacy we have been talking about over the last two days, that what is the most effective way to bring change, whether, whether the policy advocacy or the social advocacy or both, and uh, if the both are uh, going to be effective. So uh, along with these policy changes, the social change, the mindset of people, use people, local people from the same area that, that is my uh, one uh, addition to the discussion which we already had. Thank you. Excellent. Um, we will open it up for Q&A. Um, there are mics on this, uh, in the back. Um, this lady uh, right here. Yes, yeah. And we will take a couple of questions at a time. And if you could, I, I, I think it was, but you can go ahead and then we'll, we'll come to you. We'll take a couple of questions at a time. And if you could limit your question to one question and have it be a question, not a comment, that would be wonderful. Hi, uh, I'm Samira Daniels. I'm interested in education. This is a question, uh, you were talking about the, the broader uh, purpose of education and how uh, you know you would like to communicate that to uh, uh, the girls. Do you do you see any models? I mean, in, India has you know a great deal of uh, uh, you know research on this, and of course Europe, England, and I, I wonder if you could draw upon that, or do you think that there's some sort of uh, Intrinsic, uh, you know, that, that that you can call something about, you know, about uh, Pakistan in the that culture of South Asia, and how you can sort of meld that into some that would bring more meaning to the community. Yes, um, if you could pass the mic. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the panel, and I think this is a good follow up. I'm Urvashi Sani. And just to introduce myself and why I find this so interesting, my parents migrated from Rawalpindi, and my in-laws are from the frontier province, really, from uh, Peshawar. So you are and from my city. Yes. <laughs> so I'm really half Pakistani, Indian, whatever. So my point is that, um, which is why I identify so closely to everything you've been saying, uh, both very strong patriarchal cultures, actually the same culture. And... Um, uh, you know, Sumbal, the points you were raising about all the girls, even though they come from Fata, which is a war zone, like you said, all the conversations you had with the girls and with the teachers, what I'm struck by is that even though the areas I've been working in are not war zones, I'm in, you know, some remote areas in Rajasthan, remote areas in UP, and rural areas, and some not so remote either, the points are exactly the same. 
the girls have just the same. In fact, the same thing. And we have science education and the teachers talking about boundary walls and bathrooms and all of those, exactly the same, right? And uh, so, I mean, and also in terms of exposure, I think the rural, even in the rest of Pakistan, as I know in the rest of many parts of India, they have similarly no exposure and there's a difference between the urban and rural. My question, Abbasi Saab, was really uh, to you about, you know, you mentioned that uh, when you go, you, the way you talk to them is that can you send your children to school and not your girls? And you mentioned that example about the man who said, well, you can look at my, I mean, I look at it, but you're not a doctor, kind of a thing. My point was that uh, this is, these are very strong patriarchal mindsets, right? And as long as we keep pussyfooting around them, I don't know if they will change. So when is a good time to address them directly and to actually attack patriarchy very directly? Because that is the reason we have all these problems, right? So whether it's in Pakistan or India or anywhere else, and we are the same people, uh, when do we attack them directly? We found it very useful to attack it directly, by the way. And of course, you face some resistance, but, not, but it, it melts. And the girls have learned to attack it very directly, too. And in classrooms, we attack it very directly. Raise the issue of girls' rights to themselves and to their lives. But, and, of course, to an education, but mainly. So I'm wondering, when do you think, Abhasi Saab, that it is a good time to attack, these direct, to attack patriarchy directly? Excellent question. <laughs> we'll... We're all waiting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll... we'll let, let's... Let's uh, go to the panel, uh, and then and then we'll move to um, to the audience again. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. People are more eager. Okay, to you know, um, saying directly to them something is very difficult task. Even we have, you know, law there, twenty five Article twenty five A, which emphasizes on the free and uh, you know compulsory education. Uh, for the children from, from 5 to 16. And then uh, all uh, provinces have law. But, you know, its implementation in the Earth while FATA was very difficult, you know. Even instructions were issued to the political agents uh, uh, that parents should send their children to the school. But unfortunately, it did not work there because... Uh, it, the system, there was no system actually. There was FCR, um, uh, Sumbal and uh, Madiha has talked about it. And uh, no proper law implementation was there. Now, fortunately, we are part of the KP. And, and all the law which are promulgated uh, by the, either by the provincial government or federal government will equally be implemented in the um, uh, FATA uh, region are newly merged district, and hopefully uh, the, st uh, the parents will send their children to the school. And secondly, I just want to mention you that there is no electricity in most of the region. And le let's say 90% of the FATA uh, do not have electricity. So no television is there, no electronic media is there. So they have no access, you know, to the modern world. The only source of information to them is the uh, uh, Voice of America Radio Diva, which is spoken, which, which is listened there in the Pashto. So how can we expect that uh, an enlightened nation will emerge from there? If we give them some opportunity to ac have access to modern techniques and to, to other people, to models, um, then obviously they will try uh, to have such girl student, uh, girl daughter like Malala Yousafzai. Even I think nobody knows about Malala Yousafzai in the tribal area, if you ask them. Yeah. Um, I, I think just, just to sort of follow up on Urvashi's question, I, in, in some ways, you know, you, you talked very eloquently about the problems in FATA, but this, the pit patriarchy problem is something that exists beyond, beyond FATA. And so maybe, maybe Jamila or Sumbal, if you would like to ad address that question and take um, the other lady's question, and then we'll go back to the audience. I think, yes, there is something that I can even um, relate to my research. Uh, not many, but you know, a few 
teachers uh, shared with me about having this patriarchal issue, not just um, within their own family, uh, with parents, because those girls were allowed to get education because their parents were really good at that and they understood the value of education for girls. But once they got married, you see? So there was a feeling of insecurity in their husbands. So it's so deep-rooted into the culture that I don't, I, I definitely agree with Abbas Saab that it's not like something to be done like that. There is no one starting point that you can start with, especially when people don't have access to any kind of media. I'm so glad that, you know, uh, recently some mobile companies have started having a mobile service in, in that region. And um, one of the uh, broadband uh, suppliers is, is my best friend. And he supplies uh, broadband to Islamabad. And I'm always, you know, talking to Every time I meet him, I ask him, what about FATA? <laughs> what about FATA? And then very recently, they opened up an office in Peshawar. And I was like, oh, that's a good news. Because now you are in Fata, Fata, uh, Peshawar and there is just a few miles more to cover when you get into Fata. Because I can see that, you know, even those very few areas where television is available, girls and especially women are watching TV and they are watching dramas. That's what I learned from teachers and students. And they said, you know, that's a great... And they told me that if you can convey some message through TV to our parents, they will change their minds. So... I mean, it's, it's just starting. We cannot say this is possible and that is not possible. For me, everything is possible. But it needs some time. We have to, we have to just keep an eye on what is available and make the best use of that. And, and for me, media of any sort is our opportunity. And uh, then I think we missed one point, that there are, there are no courts of law in FATA. People don't have any any uh, court to go to if they are wronged. So uh, with merger, that would be a great opportunity for people to have police force because there are uh, traditional jirgas, mostly headed by uh, male members. So that is a change in that system when there was no alternative system was not, I think, possible. But with this merger, with these opportunities coming up, so laws which are uh, there in the rest of the country, like uh, compulsory, like uh, minimum age of marriage, that is now a law. And there are a number of now cases where girls show up in the courts and in the police stations that we are, get, we are being married, and that is blown up in media. That brings another uh, the connection, which Sumul was just saying, that if there are laws, if there are courts, if there are police stations, and if there is media, then we can expect change. That's excellent. All right. We will take three more questions at this stage. Um, I think we missed um, uh, responding to her question. That was important if I okay. could just sure. quickly respond <laughs> Very to that. Quickly. Uh, yes, there are some good models which are available. But the question for me is uh, when I choose them, I need to first look at that, whether it will work in FATA or not, given all the circumstances we have just talked about. So very recently, um, 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 I have heard about uh, Girls Rising having a great project starting I think already started in Pakistan. So that's a great inspiration for me that is based on video messaging, storytelling. So that, that's one opportunity. But because that too is related to media, I have to wait for the time till that, that area gets access to some media. So yes, models are there, but definitely I'll have to be careful about how and when to use it. All right. Um, this lady right here, then, then in that aisle over there, right there, yes. Thank you very much um, for this is a great panel. Uh, I'm Guljan from Malala Fund. Um, so I have a question to Mr. Abbas. So you mentioned that um, KP has 28% uh, of the provincial budget uh, allocated to education. And now with this merger, I'm wondering is KP going to have like increase its budget, total budget, to meet the needs of both KP and FATA or uh, is the most of the budget going to be allocated to FATA and, you know, the budget will stay the same. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a couple more questions and then we'll come back to you. So um, right across the aisle, please. Yes. Hi, my name is Zainab and I'm also from Pakistan. Um, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. It's of a very large interest to me personally. Um, uh, Sumba, you had mentioned earlier that 
One of your recommendations was engaging uh, the local community and com like community partners. Um, and earlier, Mayada had also mentioned the use of uh, engaging local religious muftis as a part of her uh, project. So my question is, given the context of FATA and the, the Talib Talibanization of it, how, how successful do you think it would be to engage local religious leaders there? And how much of an effect would that have? Or have you seen any sort of successful endeavors of the sort being made? Yeah. Great. Uh, can we have some more questions? Um, and there, there's a question right there, yes. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Megan uh, Donahue. I'm a gender and education consultant, and I just have two questions, very quick. So for the community schools, do the parents pay for the community schools or any tuition? Uh, okay, and if they do, do they have any say in what happens in the schools, uh, like if teachers are absent, et cetera? And then for female education this morning, um, Sambo, you said about the female teachers would benefit perhaps in the future. Uh, I'm just curious, how would you recruit for those teachers to ensure that they will empower the girls? Um, because it's a good idea, but sometimes it doesn't always work out the way we want. You can't hear me? I think I, so community schools, uh, a question around paying for community schools, and then and teachers. Okay. okay. Excellent. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to our panel. So a question around the budget for FATA, around religious muftis, community schools, teachers. Um, very quickly, so that we can have another round of questions before we conclude at 2.10. Yeah, thank you. Actually, the budget goes from the federal government. We call it NFC. Uh, NFC award. Uh, every province has got its own share in the federal government. Uh, the KP has got its own uh, share in the NFC award. And uh, obviously, the FATA has got its own share, and that will go to the FATA. And uh, as I have already mentioned, that the mega uh, projects or socioeconomic plan is already there. One is for the 10 years, and the other one is for the five years. Um, it is just waiting for the fund from the federal government. The, the basic aim of these mega projects, I already told you, they to, to bring uh, FATA at par with the uh, KP. And secondly, as Dr. Jamila has mentioned, that there is no judiciary system, no police system. So th th these all need, you know, financial uh, uh, fund from the federal government. You know obviously to have uh, infrastructure for the policing and for the uh, judiciary system. Obviously, we need fund from the federal government. So we are waiting for that. Just very quickly, the NFC is the National Finance Commission. Um, so the, the, they're not merging the NFC award for KP and the newly merged districts? It's not going to be one award? It will be merged together, but the share of the uh, FATA will be there in it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yes, on your uh, religious leaders question, uh, you would be amazed to know that uh, data from my research, particularly in Khabar and Muhammad, says that um, religious leaders no more are interfering into education. So that's a good news. On the contrary, I think Mr. Abbas can later tell you more about some reforms they have already done in madrasas so that the, the, the religious leaders can be uh, made uh, like a mainstream teacher. So they, they have a positive role to play, and that's what I heard even from the communities, that if these religious leaders and madrasas have more formal education included into their curriculum, so that's when you know, they become more... Um, what, what should I say, um, the catal they, they can become catalysts. Why? Because many parents prefer religious education over the worldly education. So having them um, sent to madrasas where the worldly education is also possible is an opportunity. So yes. And then the other question was about um, teachers. Um, I think that's still... Uh, a struggle, as Abbasab also said. We need more graduates in FATA. 
if we have to hire local teachers. And then when it comes to training, I think uh, my recommendation to Abbas Ab is, and I've already talked to him, is that focusing more on the in-service training or training or capacity building on job. Because we cannot wait for three or four years for having new teacher, teachers who are well-trained. So we need to really focus on the current teachers, whoever they are, because some of them are very low qualified. So it will, need, it will really uh, need a huge amount of work on them so that they first understand how important girls' empowerment is because convincing them first is important. And then we can inculcate that into the girls. So I think that's a huge task. I don't know how Abasa will plan for it. I'll, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm just adding one thing about the uh, Dini Madaris, uh, you know, religious uh, schools. So the government is also trying, you know, to bring them at, uh, on the mainstream. So uh, FATA is one of them that we have started uh, projects for them. We are giving uh, teachers uh, to them. They are recruited by, own, by the, uh, them, but we are paying them. So they are teachers who will teach the students uh, mathematics, English, uh, science, and computer as well. And uh, from the next year, we will also provide them uh, free textbooks as well. So in this way, you know, the, the, those students who prefer to go to madrasa in order to get uh, religious education, so obviously they will get the modern education as well. So at least they, these students, they will pass their secondary examination and they will come uh, for their assessment to the uh, different boards. And uh, secondly, I, I just want to mention about uh, non-formal schooling. That is a community school. They, 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 this is one uh, uh, type of the non-formal education. We hire a uh, teacher for them, and basically they are local teachers uh, in the female schools. And, and uh, they have their own building. You know, either it is a, a room from the school or it is a hujra. We, we call it hujra mean a, a guest room like uh, building so the, the female teacher they they bring the stu local students uh, and uh, uh, teach uh, them for the entirement and then we pay them and uh, the parents uh, do not need to pay for uh, 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 their kids uh, because uh, under article and constitution the government is bound to provide free and compulsory education they, the students, they do not pay the fee to the school. Even we provide free textbooks to them. The only thing which they do, they, 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 the, the uniform they are supposed to buy. The government was also planning to give them uniform, but there was the issue of, you know, the sizes was there. So it postponed the idea. So the parents are uh, supposed to give them the uniform. And, uh, uh, you know, there, is, there are reasons, for multiple reasons for uh, dropout and out-of-school children. And poverty is one of the reasons. While sitting in this posh and cozy room, you cannot imagine uh, the status of those pe people, you know. In severe weather condition, in, uh, in cold condition, I have seen that uh, most of the students, male and female, they come to the school even in the, in the slipper, you know, the... Uh, uh, rubber shoes and on, only socks they wear. If we ask them why you are not wearing proper uh, boots and shoes, say, they say we cannot afford it. So the poverty is one of the hurdles uh, for not send, sending their children. And secondly, uh, Sumbal has mentioned that uh, the, the, the primary education and uh, secondary education, so we, if we see the graph, you know, the, the there is huge dropout in, uh, while jumping from uh, primary to middle school. And the only one reason is that parents cannot afford, you know, the children to send them to the school. Instead of sending the children to the school, they prefer the girls to work uh, uh, with their uh, mothers in the home. And the boys who pass fifth class, uh, they, are, they make them enable to uh, either to do something... Uh, uh, help with the uh, father or uh, send their, you know, sheep to the field in order to graze them. 
So the major work are, uh, you know, these for them, not to send them to the school. Jamila. Uh, yeah, that uh, one question about the teachers, because KP has this system that they don't know. They no longer require any uh, teacher pre service teacher education, they induct teachers and then they give them an induction training of nine months or something, six months, and that is uh, off, off job and uh, before job. So that is a, a model which uh, the question on teachers that, that may help that this new system when uh, KP will be, uh, FATA will be merged with KP. And on religious leaders, but, but when we talked, it was about the gatekeepers, that they are usually the gatekeepers. And uh, uh, in community schools and when some services were provided in different parts when I studied the, uh, the, those models, uh, religious leaders were involved so that they would not resist these services in the area. And as Sumbal said, that they, they raised no resistance from religious leaders anymore, but as far as the madrasa system and then uh, providing uh, uh, more general education in madrasa along with religious education, that is a deeper, deeper issue, and that is something which uh, is uh, like more complacently dealt with because like there are a number of researches, and I know Madhya's research as well, that even in public schools, the curriculum and the textbooks which are taught, they are no different from what is taught in madrasa. So when we talk about that madrasa is part of the problem, it is not just madrasa, so it is irrespective that whether we are providing uh, uh, general education in madrasas or we are providing religious education in public schools. This whole system, the textbooks, they are high, hugely infused with the ideas, uh, ideology, which was promoted at certain time, which I mentioned to the War of Titans. So that was the time when this uh, ideology was infused in the curriculum, and it remains there. So whether students are going into the uh, madrasa system or the public sector system, the results are the same. They come out, they come out mainly with similar worldview, and there are uh, researches, uh, Dr. Tariq Rahman and other people who have been writing on it for a long time, and Madhya has also done some research on it. There are serious issues with curriculum, which need to be tackled, irrespective whether it is FATA or uh, KP or anywhere in Pakistan. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, there is no more time for, for questions, but, but just following up very briefly on Jamila's point and then wrapping up um, our wonderful panel today, um, Islamist parties in Pakistan are a huge obstacle to both curriculum reform as well as reform and regulation of Pakistan's madrasas. This is not just a, a problem in Fatah. This is a problem for the whole country. And so how the current government addresses that challenge is something that will remain to be seen and it's not going to be easy given you know the protests and the that we've seen in the past week and the emboldening of islamist parties over the over the decades really in the in the country um, please Please join me uh, in, in um, sort of thanking this wonderful panel, uh, Mr. Abbas Khan and Dr. Jamila Razak, who traveled from Pakistan, uh, Sumbal Naveed, who gave a, a very compelling presentation and has a wonderful paper uh, out on leveraging political transitions for girls in the tribal areas of Pakistan. I think it was a very rich discussion. We, we um, really saw a granular picture of life for girls in, in FATA and really the barriers for, for educating them, but also the opportunities ahead. So I think it was a very constructive discussion as well. So please join me in thanking the panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.